There's different kinds of freedom. The freedom of ownership of your time, which probably means you're not working 10 hours a day in a corporate law firm, but you might be very poor. Material wealth gives you a kind of economic freedom, but probably deprives you of temporal freedom. There's plenty of homeless guys living under bridges who have all the temporal freedom in the world. They can do whatever they want all day long, but they have an enormous amount of, of food insecurity, economic insecurity, physical safety concerns. Those are also constraints on your freedom of a different sort. Basically, there's a trade-off. Welcome to We Do Hard Things, the show about facing fears, taking big risks, and chasing down dreams. On today's show, I get a chance to sit down and talk to the New York Times best-selling author, the Oscar-nominated documentarian, and the frontline war journalist, Sebastian Younger. We talk about freedom. What does it mean? How do we get it? And what's the true cost of being free? We also dig into a pretty badass story about what he learned when he and three friends spent the better part of a year dodging railroad cops, sleeping under bridges, cooking over fires, drinking from creeks, all as they walked 400 miles of railway lines, illegally, I might add, up the East Coast of America. Right before we started the recording, you just showed me your flip phone. Why do you have a flip phone? <laughs> because I, you know, I, I, I want to minimize the distractions in my life. And when I'm walking down the street, I want to be on that street and in the world. And when I'm with my children, I want to be with my children. And when I'm in the woods, I want to be in the woods. And when I'm at work at my desk, I want to be at work at my desk. And that's, I get my email. I do all of the, you know, sort of interaction with the human race. Uh, at least professionally, I do at my desk, at my laptop. And but when I'm out there in the world, that's the only place I want to be. I don't want to have one foot in my um, sort of digital obligations. Huh? I, I honestly, I didn't even know you could buy a flip phone anymore. Like, I, I, or is this just something that you've really babied and taken care of for the last ten years? No, I, you know, I lose them or or go swimming with them or they break, you know, pretty regularly. So you can get them. They're you know, the advantage is they're cheap. The plans are cheap. You know, it, te you know, it texts. I can text. You know, it's difficult to text, so I don't spend too much time doing it. But it, it really, you know, it's a question of, like, where, you, where do you want to be? Where, you know, this is your life. Like, where do you want to be in your life? And if you want to be partly in your phone, connecting to things and people that actually aren't around you, great. Get a smartphone. But it takes it, – the, the cost of the smartphone comes directly out of – your experience in the world that's actually around you and the people that are actually around you. And it, for me, that's just a bad deal. We're going to talk about the book Freedom that you wrote. And it's a really, if I can, if I can not offend you, it's a really strange book to me because it's told through the narrative of you and, and a handful of friends or, or colleagues or men um, who have all spent time in service overseas or in combat who you decide that you're going to just start walking, like you're just going to start walking. And it seems like a very um, uh, uh, intentional thing to put yourself in an environment where you're just going to walk and walk and walk and see what happens. It's, it seems like the same type of person who does not have a smartphone, who does a flip phone, so that way you can be present in the moment is the type of person who will decide to just walk 400 miles on train tracks over the course of a year with a bunch of friends for no reason. I mean, is that essentially what happened? Yeah. I mean, I was on the Amtrak once and I realized that you could walk alongside the rail lines pretty much the whole way from New York to DC is maintenance roads and you know, dirt bike trails and cornfields and junkyards and, you know, ghettos and suburbs and everything else. But there was a way to sort of thread your way through American society in what basically is a strip of no man's land, right? It's owned by the freight companies and the rail companies, and it's illegal to be there. And as a result, there's almost no one there, and there's certainly no police surveillance. Uh, and so we were able to commit what we call high-speed vagrancy. You know, we were moving 10, 15, 20, sometimes 25 miles a day, um, carrying a full load. We had all the gear we needed to survive. We were drinking out of creeks and sleeping under bridges and cooking over campfires, and we went through the middle of every imaginable American terrain, you know, from super urban to super rural. And um, what we wanted to do, you know, a couple of things. We wanted to encounter America in a very raw way. 
Um, that's why we weren't on the Appalachian Trail, for example. We weren't walking in the wilderness, which is gorgeous, but we wanted to encounter America and American society. And we wanted to also sort of like return to that feeling of interdependence that you can get in combat or any kind of marginal situation, interdependence on each other. We really needed each other to do these small tasks of keeping ourselves fed and comfortable and safe during the day. We actively had to avoid the police, and that required a whole sort of like tactical awareness, if you will, that reminded us quite a lot of combat. Um, and there was something about that endeavor that felt very ancient and able to plug us into our, our sort of deepest, most simple selves. You did this trip in segments over the course of a year. Uh, it was you and a few other people, and people rotated through. But what I was most curious about, again, with this trip, this trip that ended up becoming, what, 400 miles, you said walking 10, 15 miles per day, encountering all kinds of different things. This isn't something that just one does on a whim. I mean, you don't just take a few months off or a few weeks here and a few weeks there and what have you, and and you just do it. I mean, do you? Like, <laughs> like did you just, like, was it this moment of like cathartic, like, get me the hell out of real life. Anything is better than this. I just need a break from the, the weight yeah. of all of responsibility. It was extremely hard. It was physically very, very hard, right? We were walking all day long along railroad lines in, in a complicated, rough environment, carrying 60, 70 pounds on our backs. Um, and there's something about there's something about the ease of modern life which feels um, diminishing. It feels like you are kind of getting a free ride, which you are. In, in sort of evolutionary terms, you definitely are. And returning to an element, to an environment uh, where you actually have to provide for your own basic needs every day for some days or weeks or 100 miles or whatever it may be. Um, there's something about that that I found extremely um, strengthening and clarifying and healthy. You know, I was going through a life change. I was 50 years old. I was, my first marriage was ending uh, and ending in a very friendly fashion. My ex-wife and I are still good friends, but it was a very sorrowful, sorrowful time. And I, you know, I just wanted to do some thinking and, you know, the, you know, we, I was out there with three other guys. So there's four of us and my dog, Daisy, two of us were getting divorced, right? Me and one other guy, half the group were getting divorced, right? And not, not by intention, but it never came up. Like in 400 miles, no one brought it up. Like the two guys who were getting divorced didn't bring it up. And the two guys who weren't getting divorced sure as hell didn't bring it up. It just never got mentioned. We were um, not out there for um, a kind of like encounter therapy session. We were out there to sort of cleanse our body and souls and and to to sort of fight every day for for our most basic needs. And there, there was something about that which, of course, reflects our human evolution and most of our human history and you when you return to that level of existence um, it changes you and in good ways and as I say in my book you know over the course of 400 miles under bridges and abandoned buildings and fields and back lots and wherever most nights we were the only people who knew where we were and that there there are many definitions of freedom but surely that's one of them and that was you know that was how I, I came to to bring this narrative of the trip into my book, Freedom, which is, you know, a lot of the book is, a, is, is historical and researched, um, but the narrative of the trip comes into this book on freedom precisely because in some ways that was the most free time in all of our lives. We have moments in our lives where the very things that we wanted, the very things that we worked for, the very things that we strive for, we find out are either hollow or disappointing or we no longer want. And yet we worked like there's the sunken cost. We worked so hard for them that we couldn't possibly imagine giving them up. Yeah. And so when you touch on freedom, there was, gosh, I don't, I don't have the exact, I have all of these little notes and all these little underlines, but, but I, you're speaking, I believe about the hunters societies versus the farming or agricultural societies yeah. And there's this moment where you just say, you know, plowing a field all day long, working to get food in ancient societies or working at a law firm. And you just like tuck that in could become the, the most repetitive form of servitude there is. And I was like, that's just it. Throughout all of what you were, you were speaking about, I continue to just think of those of us 
who work the corporate jobs, those of us who are parents, those of us who um, are entrepreneurs who built a trap for ourselves through um, finances or through career paths or through whatever it is. We just, we hit a point where we're like, is this it? Is this all there is? And so in, in the, the lens of that with freedom, how do you work through this idea of freedom and untrapping oneself? Because again, I see in your trip this, and in a lot of your work, actually, this ability, this courage to just put yourself in a situation and see what happens. Yeah. And let me just say that hunter-gatherers, I'm sure the, the thoughtful ones, the equivalents of you and maybe of myself, might have come to a moment where they thought, is this all there is, throwing sticks at rabbits for dinner? Like, So it's not that other societies aren't immune to those philosophical questions about what's the point of life. Basically, there's a trade-off, right? There's different kinds of freedom. You can have freedom, the freedom of ownership of your time, right? Which probably means you're not working 10 hours a day in a corporate law firm or 14 hours a day in a corporate law firm. But you might be very poor, right? So material wealth gives you a kind of economic freedom, but probably deprives you of temporal freedom. There's plenty of homeless guys living under bridges who have all the temporal freedom in the world. They can do whatever they want all day long, but they have an enormous amount of, of food insecurity, economic insecurity, physical safety concerns. Those are also constraints on your freedom of a different sort. So the way that society worked this out about 10,000 years ago was that you know, some groups of humans in the Middle East and Mesopotamia started planting wild grains and harvesting them. They became the first agriculturalists. So if you stay in one place as a sedentary society, and harvest grain, right? You plant and harvest grain. You are removing yourself from the great insecurity of hunter-gatherers of never quite knowing where your next meal is coming from, right? But what you've done is change yourself to a, a, a seasonal cycle, and eventually you've changed yourself to the unbelievably backbreaking work of, of Stone Age agriculture, and ultimately, with the rise of the first cities, you have um, made yourself less free because those societies were top-down uh, hierarchies where the vast majority of people lived in a kind of servitude and owed a huge amount of tax, which paid for standing armies that were then able to not defend the society, but also oppress the society. So th th there was a fork in the road 10,000 years ago where some societies remained mobile uh, and materially poor. And other societies remained, became sedentary and materially rich, but less free in sort of some social ways. And that's perfectly exemplified by the, the tribal societies of the American Southwest. There were the Apache, who were materially poor and nomads. They could, they could move 70 miles a day, uh, evading U.S. cavalry. Um, and there were the Pueblo societies that, that grew, uh, that planted corn and other vegetables, lived in um, fortified towns on top of mesas, right? And when the Spaniards showed up, uh, and then the Americans, those the, the, the wealthy Pueblo societies were rolled immediately, right? The Apache remained free for 300 plus years until 1880, 1886 was the last band of wild Apache that was finally sort of cornered and surrendered. Their mobility gave them enormous freedom, even though they're materially poor. So the American Southwest exemplified this fork in the road that all of society, all of human society went through about 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. As you share this, I just think of, in the modern sense, the hunter, the hunter gatherer, the person with all of the freedom. You could look at the bohemian, you could look at the creative, you could look at the person who's a freelancer who, who chooses to travel the world and you think, oh, what the freedom. But but they have so much uncertainty in terms of what comes next. Yep. And then there are the people who, you know, I've, I've owned a business for 15 years, done very well for myself. I want a lot more. But every single breakthrough, every single next level just further grounds me to stay here when I had kids. Well, what about the school system? And what about the mortgage? And what about all of the just this stuff that grounds us here? This just all, you know, you either accept freedom and uncertainty or you accept certainty and you just give up freedom. Well, yeah, I mean, let's just be clear, like in a modern Western society like ours, our, I mean, the ultimate loss of freedom is to be killed by an enemy. 
Right. Why, right. why is that? Why, why would that be the ultimate loss of freedom? Well, you're, well, you're dead. I mean, you have no more, choice, <laughs> right? You're, but you're dead. So you got nothing to worry about, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I mean, okay. Philosophically, you could put it that way too, but, that, but, but your, your, your freedom, I mean, historically for humans, the most immediate threat to one's freedom is that an enemy tribe a predatory enemy tribe will come in and kill or enslave you and your people, right? I mean, that's for tens, hundreds of thousands of years, that's been a human reality. And if your little community of hunter-gatherers with spears and bows and arrows can't defend yourselves against an enemy that would kill and enslave you, um, then you're not going to remain free for very long. 5,000 years ago, a group called the Yamnaya were a nomadic, very warlike nomadic group from the Russian steppe. Um, they, they went into battle on horse-drawn chariots when the horse was sort of new to human society. They traveled in all male groups. They were sort of the, uh, in some ways, the first, you could think of them as the first motorcycle gang. <laughs> they, they, they Sons their, of anarchy uh, hundreds of years ago. <laughs> well, five, thousands of years ago, 5,000 years ago during the mm -hmm. Neolithic. And they cruised through Europe and they, and they swept into the Iberian Peninsula, what's now Spain and Portugal. And over the course of 100 years, they killed all of the men in Iberia and clearly mated with the women. The men of Iberia experienced a radical loss of, of freedom and autonomy. They were annihilated. They were scrubbed from the human gene pool. And their inability to repel these invaders meant that they lost their, lost their freedom. So the first, first and foremost, to defend your freedom, you have to be able to defend your community, your families, your loved ones from an enemy attacker. Um, that has largely been ta that task has largely been taken care of in Western society. We have a professional army. America is probably not going to be invaded by the Yamnaya or anyone else. So the other component of freedom, as I say in the book, is if you're well organized enough to defend yourself against an enemy, your the society is also well organized enough to have um, leadership enslave their own people, oppress their own people. I mean, the very same military, the Iraqi military under Saddam Hussein, the Spanish military under Francisco Franco, the fascist who took over Spain in 1936, that same military that would fight an outside force can be used to oppress their own people, right? To oppress society. And that's what, exactly what happened in the city-states 10, 10, 5, 10,000 years ago in Mesopotamia. They were totalitarian states that existed as 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 was the the, uh, the Middle Ages in Europe, a feudal society in in Europe. These were totalitarian states that existed to empower and support the the top top elite of society, and pretty much everyone else were serfs. And so, you know, when you use the apparatus of state that should defend the community against itself you've lost another form of freedom. And that's where your rights come in. I mean, there's sort of freedom. When you talk about freedom, you're really talking about freedom from oppression from the outside. When you talk about your rights, you're talking about uh, your right to not be oppressed by your own government. And so we have the right to free speech and things like that. We, the, 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 our constitution protects our rights vis-a-vis -vis the government that is in charge of regulating society. And those rights become a very, very important point of contention between liberals and conservatives, et cetera, as we all well know. But that's sort of the basic breakdown of freedom. If you're, you have to be free from attack and also free from internal oppression. And, and democracy basically was an attempt to sol solve both of those problems at once. Democracies are very long, uh, long lasting. They, they, they do peaceful transfers of power very effectively. Militarily, they are extremely robust, right? Some of the most powerful nations in the world are Western democracies, um, and they're quite good at protecting people's individual rights within, within the society. Talk about freedom within society. I mean, are you free to do nothing all day long and not work and still survive? No, you're not really free to do that because it means someone else has to work for you, right? Um, are, are, you, are you free to have no obligations whatsoever to the group? Um, no, you're not, that you, you're not free to do that either. I mean, never in human history has society offered anyone the deal that we, the society, will protect you and take care of you and support you and give you a livelihood, but you actually don't owe anything in return, right? That's just never happened in human history. And the idea that suddenly in Western society, you can sort of demand uh, that you don't have, to, I mean, look, we are not free to drive in America. We drive on the right-hand side of the road and we all do that so we don't have car accidents. You are not free to drive on the left-hand side of the road. That doesn't mean you're not a free person, but you have obligations to society, obligations that keep, up, keep us all safe. 
mm-hmm. that you have to adhere to. And if you don't, you'll be arrested, right? It's pretty simple. If we can shift a little bit uh, to your career, I mean, you have done some remarkable, like remarkable things from, from you know, your, your career as, as a journalist to a documentarian, but also even before that, I mean, you've been, I, I've, I've heard that you've put yourself kind of in dangerous situations for, for most of your career, whether that's through the type of work you did, you know, climbing trees or things. So how is it that you decided that you could make a career or when was it along the path that you were like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, because, because it's not a, it's not a traditional career path that you followed. Well, I, you know, when I got out of college, I studied cultural anthropology in college and I did my, I was a pretty good distance runner in college. Um, and I ran the mile, two mile, you know, 10,000 meters, pretty good times. And I, and I spent a summer training on the Navajo reservation with the best Navajo runners. And I wrote a thesis uh, on Navajo long distance runners, and which is an old tradition, pre pre Columbia. How did you get connected to even make that happen? Boy, it was a long time ago. I don't even remember. But I, I got <laughs> I got invited by a school in Fort Defiance, Arizona, to like take take over a trailer and you know run some school program that kind of fell apart. But I just stayed and kept training with their best guys, and they were very very good runners, and. Um, so I wrote a thesis on Navajo long distance running and that process got me, made me want to be a writer, right? So I got out of college with a, you know, a degree that isn't known for bringing people enormous amounts of wealth, a degree in anthropology. <laughs> and I decided to be a journalist and an author. Like how would that, so that I got a job doing construction and I did all kinds, I was a high climber for tree companies. I did all kinds of jobs that paid me some cash. But I kept working away, trying to become a freelance journalist. And eventually I went to Bosnia during the Civil War to see if I could work as a war reporter. And in the middle of that, I submitted a book proposal for a book about a storm. It became my first book, The Perfect Storm. Um, I didn't set out to have a career doing risky things. It's just that some of the things that I did happened to be risky. And some of the war reporting that I did, I mean, the point wasn't to take risks. The point was to report on certain stories and some of those stories were risky. So, um, what drew you, what drew you to, uh, those environments or even like war reporting? I, you know, I grew up in a very, very safe, quiet and arguably boring suburb. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I, I felt like it wasn't real life. Like it wasn't life and there was anything close to the way most of humanity has experienced life for most of human history. So, you know, I just, I wanted to put myself in situations where I could be tested. I, you know, I guess you could say this is going to sound a little old fashioned, but I felt like I had had such a danger free, mm-hmm. comfortable life that I didn't, you know, in my early twenties, I didn't feel like a man. I still felt like I was a child. You know, I hadn't proved myself to myself or to others. And, um, so I, uh, there was something about that process that, changed my view of myself because I'd gone through hard things. Going through hard things um, is, an, you know, unless it kills you, is enormously beneficial it's in so many ways. And, and I, I, because of the circumstances that I was born in, I had to seek those hard things out. They didn't seek me out. I could have avoided them if I'd wanted to. I had to sort of seek them out. You've been in combat reporting on it. You've been a part of a lot of different projects different books, you know, you did, you did this, you did this walk. And I often wonder for people who are writers or musicians or creators or authors or poets or whatever it might be, you need to like live life to get, to get enough creative juice to go off and do the things you produce. And if you just do that in the safety or the comfort of your home all day long, every day, I mean, you just, there's just, it's just the same. And so as you approached each of these kind of I don't, I don't even want to call them endeavors, but as you went from war zone to war zone or, or uh, you know, contract to contract or project to project, how much of it was you seeking something out knowing that stuff will come or going there in support of an idea you already had? It was always an outline of a, of a, of a story that I wanted to write about. Of course, I didn't know what would happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, one never does, but... Um, uh, I never just went someplace to see. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna be here now. And let's see what comes to me. Like uh, because you know uh, these are assignments, and magazine editors tend to want want to know what you're gonna talk about before you go. <laughs> yeah, well, you, the, you know the the illegal diamond trade in Sierra Leone, 
you know, the civil war in Liberia and the role that diamonds played in, in that and, you know, whatever. Like, I mean, they want to they want to know what you're commit what they're commissioning. And as someone who goes out and does these things, how hard is it to come home to, you know, once you have these experiences and I imagine they're exciting and scary and fun and you're pursuing it and you're on the hunt and it's creative and then you come home and it's just like life must be so vanilla. Well, yeah. And I mean, let me just say there's thousands of people that work as overseas reporters and in relief, doing relief work. And, you know, much of it's a lot more dangerous or, or, or hard or long term than anything I've ever done. You know, the longest I've been overseas is a couple of months. Granted, it was in a very, very um, difficult environment. But, you know, it's not like I'm overseas for years at a time. And, it, you know, coming back after a three week, you know, uh, immersion in an African civil war, uh, I mean, among other things, it's a huge relief to not be terrified the whole time. And and then the then in some ways the really hard part starts, which is, I mean, I'm a writer, right? And and I'm I'm a journalist and a writer. And for me, the most sort of sacred task is to convert reality into words that people can digest and learn learn about the world through. You know. And so when I come back, I have to start writing, and I have to take this crazy experience, this super complex situation that I've tried to understand um, and convert it into six or 7,000 words that will, uh, will be of some value, of some use, you know, and that will be compelling to read, where you read the first paragraph and you just can't stop yourself because, wow, that's so interesting, you know, like, so, uh, you know, when I come back, I'm not just experiencing modern America, which is pleasurable and demoralizing all at the same time. What I'm doing is I'm really focused on the work that I have to do. And then when that's done, maybe I have time to look around and see how I'm feeling and what it looks like. Um, usually, I got to say, though, usually the society that I we, that I come back to, that we all come back to, um, usually it seems sort of infantile. You know, usually it seems like people, myself included, can be quite self-indulgent about their concerns and that not that mature about their responsibilities yeah and kind of cry babies about hardship hmm. um uh, people in modern societies really hate discomfort and inconvenience uh, and not to mention real effort like they really hate it and that's of course the reality for most of the world and has been for all of human history and so it's just a it they you know we we come across as a kind of society of children and there's plenty of parts of society that are not living that way of course right yeah incredibly hard-working people but i you know if you 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 come from a sort of elite urban society and you which i do in new york right and i, and I come back and i come back and i look around at my peers and sometimes i just think man we're all children compared to say the afghans <laughs> you know, or whatever. So getting back to your walk, what I so loved about, uh, about the endeavor, the walk that you went on was, um, it seemed like accepting a hard thing just for the sake of working through it for, you know, having that sacrifice for focusing on, you know, step after step after step, which becomes painful <laughs> and, uh, and sleeping in the rain, in the cold, with the trains, the fear, the unknown, the food, you know, you speak about the fact that, that you packed so light that you could, you know, that you could take off at any moment because there's just this sense that, you know, it's just not secure. You're just living in an unsecure way. I find that inspiring because if you can do that, then what else can you do? What else can you face? Do we really need all of these things? How often do you try to challenge yourself that way? Well, I have two young children now, four and a half and one and a half. And uh, so I'm not out there on the, you know, whatever, on the front lines or on the rail lines or whatever, any other kind of line. Humans are an extraordinary species for many, many reasons. But one of them is that we are very vulnerable physically, right? In the natural world, we don't have claws, we don't have sharp teeth, we can't climb trees very well, we can't run very fast, and yet we survive and we dominate. And we do that because we live in groups. And when you accept the safety and the psychological comfort of the group, you also accept the fact that the group needs you to contribute. And one of the things that I want to impart to my daughters is how important it is and how helpful it is, how healthy it is, psychologically and physically healthy it is to contribute to the group welfare. And of course, the ultimate 
group is the, you know, the sort of core group is the family. And so, you know, that's one of the, for me, one of the most compelling reasons to go into the wilderness is to impart that lesson to one's children. Um, and the other thing, let me just add, the other extraordinary thing about humans is that we're the only species, the only mammalian species, where a smaller individual or a smaller group can defeat in combat a larger or individual or larger group. Like for most of the animal kingdom, the, the largest individual, which often is male, dominates the group and the largest group dominates the society. And in humans, small groups win all the time over, over, over more powerful groups. We're unique that way. And if that were not true, humans would not have the ability to maintain their autonomy, their freedom in the force of a more powerful foe. Basically, we would live in top-down hierarchies the way primates the way primates do, but humans don't. And so you can throughout history, I mean you look at you can look at the Taliban defeat of the greatest military power ever in history as an example of that. You can look at the mill strikes a hundred years ago, say in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, the mill the mill workers were arrayed against the National Guard with fixed bayonets, right? And yet they won uh, because they outthought them. And they, they outthought them by putting women at the front lines of the of the, the strikers, put women at the front lines. And the, these young soldiers with fixed bayonets did not know what to do with the women. And as one frustrated policeman said, one cop can handle 10 men, but it takes 10 cops to handle one woman. Mm -hmm. And as a result, partly as the result of that, the mill workers defeated the National Guard politically and legally, defeated the National Guard and the U.S. government and were successful in their strike and in changing their working conditions and their pay. Absolutely extraordinary. And that that's one component of my book is like, how does a small yeah. outpowered group manage to do that? So for my wife's 30th birthday, my, my wife and my father-in-law have this relationship where they are, they are merciful. Merc I don't know what the word would be. They're, they, they're terrible with each other. So my, my in-laws turned 50 years ago and my wife put out all of these vultures, uh, you know, 50 vultures on their front lawn in the middle of the night. So everybody would see. So my wife's turning 30. She didn't want to turn 30. Uh, my father-in-law was going to make so much fun of her. So I took her to Ireland and we went to Dublin. And of course, when you're, you know, when you're a tourist in, in Ireland or Dublin, they're super gracious. They're super nice, but you learn of course, about the plight of the Irish versus the British and just how dominated their society was by, by the British. And so when you start to, in your book to speak about, you know, 1916 and the, 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 the move for this kind of rebellion over Easter for regular people to step up to try and, you know, get rid of these, this oppressing nation for all these years. Um, it was a story that I knew of, but I didn't ever account for the sacrifice, yeah. just the sacrifice. And so when you speak about these smaller groups that always can dominate larger, there has to be this willingness to sacrifice yourself or to sacrifice something without otherwise gains just can't be made. Yeah. And then let me say that a, that a, a group that um, requires sacrifice must also require sacrifice from its leaders. Mm -hmm. Leaders that don't make an equivalent sacrifice as the people that they lead are they're not leaders; they're opportunists. Um, and so, for example, one of the um, one of the leaders of the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916, a guy named uh, Connolly, I think, um, he was the supreme sort of commander in with the uh, the the rebel forces in Dublin, right? And he was so courageous, like he would. His aides were constantly trying to drag him out of gunfire because he would be scouting positions and routes to advance and where to put the sandbags. And he'd be taking gunfire. He'd be out in the middle of the street with bullets smacking the paving stones all around him, trying to figure out what to do, what was best for his men and women. There were women in this force as well. And so he was, you know, he was shot twice and then executed by the British for his efforts. Right. But he was absolutely willing to subject himself to unbelievable risk. In or, uh, the same risk that he was asking other people to submit themselves to in this amazing uprising. And so when you have leaders that actually are opportunists, where they don't accept any risk and they blame uh, failures and, and mistakes on other people um, and, and don't make sacrifices, although they ask others to, 
they're not leaders and they are not appropriate leaders for any kind of democracy. And for me, that is the standard. And in this country, both Republican and Democratic leaders, some have been very heroic and others have been unbelievable cowards and completely self-serving. And they're not worthy of the office of president or anything on down. So for you, having seen all that you've seen and done all that you've done, you may have just touched on this now, but what does it all come down to? At the end of the day, it all comes down to what? For a lot of people, I think that the point is to lead a meaningful life where you feel like you've contributed to the welfare of those around you. However you, you know, however you want to define that. I mean, that, that could mean you're a fireman, right? That could mean you're a physicist. My father was a physicist. When I was a kid, he, he worked with sound vibrations and he figured out how to make concrete blocks that absorb sound and reduce sound levels, right? So I would go, I was a runner and I would go to ind indoor track meets and gymnasiums, right, indoor tracks, and the walls were made out of cinder blocks that were designed, that were my father's patent, right? My Those father are the ones with the little slits in them? Yes, with the little Yes, I've seen them. I've seen them and I've noticed them. Right, my father invented those. That is so right? cool. <laughs> so, so he contributed to society in, in his own way, small way or large way, right? So that makes people feel good. And if you're not contributing, if you're just attending to your own needs and desires, you know, you'll be okay, but you probably won't be very happy. I mean, statistics show, psychology, psychological studies show you probably will not be very happy. You have got to hear the conversation I had with the motivational legend, Les Brown. We dig into the toughest moments of his life. And honestly, we go places I have never heard Les talk about. Click on the video right over there to hear this real, inspiring story.